up, Zinger Nation? Welcome back to another episode of Ben Zinger Live. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Hope everyone had a great long weekend. We're back here on Ben Zing Live. It's good to be back. Good to be back in the office uh, after doing some traveling over the weekend. As we've been doing basically every Tuesday for the past couple months, we are going to be talking to Kaiju's Ryan Pinnell today, talking about uh, some AI, some AI investing. Excited about that to continue that conversation. Let me just go ahead and pull up my Benzinga Pro before we bring Ryan on just to go through, uh, you know, because it's been... A few days. We missed, obviously, the market closed yesterday for Labor Day. Um, So let's just do a quick rundown of what the markets are doing today. First day open since last Friday. Q's tech up slightly. You can see uh, up about a quarter of a a percent on the Q's on the NASDAQ composite right now. Um, Well, actually, really, it's different. The Q's are different than the NASDAQ composite, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, I think the Q's actually tracks like the NASDAQ top 100. Uh, and not the NASDAQ composite. Uh, but you can see certain tech stocks, Tesla having a good day, up 3.5%. Netflix uh, continuing to just move higher. Look at Netflix's chart on the daily chart, just kind of grinding higher and higher here. Um, Netflix is interesting right now. I'm going to, I'll maybe a- after we speak to Ryan, we can talk a little bit more about Netflix. Um, but going through the other major indices, the Dow Industrial Average down a little bit, uh, you know, about 0.16% right there. You can see. Uh, XLF, the financials, not having a great day. XLE doing a little bit better. So probably the financials dragging the Dow down a little bit and SPY kind of similar to Dow, just down slightly. So really not nothing crazy going on. Mixed market today on the, again, on the first day open of the, uh, since the long weekend, if anyone's got any stocks or, ch- or uh, stocks or, uh, you know, trades they're looking at, just make sure to drop them in the chat and we can get to them after. Um, yeah, Marky morning, quantum. How you doing? Again, I hope everyone had a great long weekend. Let me know in the chat if you guys, uh, you know, traveled anywhere, did anything exciting, rented a boat, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let me know in the chat. All right, guys, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring my man Ryan Pinnell on the stream. Let's give him our very special Zinger Nation welcome. <laughs> All right, Ryan, how are you doing today? I'm good, Aaron. How are you doing? I like your little opening there. I'm, I'm good. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good. I, mean, I sometimes I think it's important to just, I, I, I sometimes forget to zoom out and just do a quick overview of what the general market is doing. Uh, you know, I think it's helpful. It, set, it sets, the, sets the stage, if you will. Sets the stage. A, a generally weak, marginally neutral open. Exactly. Which I should say... Uh, you know, I mean, we got through August. We had a little nice rally at the end of August, but historically, August has not been a great month for stocks. And then, uh, September, October, or no way, maybe I don't. I think September also hasn't been great historically for stocks. But then October, November, December have. But I don't know. I mean, I don't, Ryan. I mean, like there's something like that. I know this is kind of you know off topic, but is that something that you would even ever consider or like look at how stocks do historically in months in the past? Sure. I mean, because that's tied to behavioral patterns, right? I mean, fine, we focus on AI directed trading, but that doesn't mean that you 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 ignore the behavior patterns that you're trying to trade off of. So, you know, you're used to quiet summers. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that the last week in December is basically dead and you have a little flurry of confusing rebalances right before the end of the year. There's a reason that Usually this week is uh, is pretty active because people are back after Labor Day, kids have gone back to schools, and they're hungry, right? You're right in between earns cycles. So, you know, people are, this is, this is the hottest time for IPOs, for example, every year. You know, you've got now, you've got February, you got May. So it, it's not like you, can, you, you, can, you get to ignore those cycles. They're, they're important to, to be mindful of, especially if you're, if you're uh, recalibrating a portfolio. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
so Ryan, let, let's hop into it. But before we get started, uh, and I, I, I know I would, if I had to guess, I'd venture to say about 99% of our audience or 90% of people watching right now are familiar with Kaiju at this point and yourself. But there may be just a couple stragglers that are popping in for the first time today. Welcome, if that's you, by the way. Um, but do you want to uh, just give us a quick rundown of Kaiju and, and maybe the dip ETF before we hop into these questions? Sure, sure. Set so the we've stage been, again, if you will. You set the stage again. Set the stage. Uh oh. At. I don't know if, like it, the, if it. Oh, never mind. Gone. I, and you froze on my end for a second, but you're good now. Who knows? You know, technology. Yeah. I can't really denigrate it, seeing as we built like a global eco ecosystem of companies on it. But whatever. So uh, Kaiju has been involved in artificial intelligence for half a decade. Some of our team members have been doing this for 30 years, some for 10. Um, we've largely done this on the private fund side. And then last December, we decided to bring uh, our expertise to the public fund side. We launched the first AI curated and directed ETF on the New York Stock Exchange called DIP uh mid-december last year and we've been running that since we have plans to bring out uh, additional ai curated and directed etf so again like it's not thematic exposure and it's not ai informed we're not using it to you know call a field down for us to make manual trade decisions on it is end-to-end -end artificial intelligence and uh yeah it's been a, it's been a it's been a good ride and obviously the last six months have been hugely validating to us you're sort of you know working in the shadow got it um i, I hopefully that's just on mine cut out again for a second but uh yeah i think that might just be on on, on my end here um all right so so ryan let's hop into it then uh, I know you built a proprietary portfolio management and trade visualization pa uh, platform at the genesis of Kaiju. Uh, can you describe this platform? I mean, it sounds just from that description, like, you know, building a proprietary visualization platform, I'm sure, uh, is, 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 is not an easy thing to do. What did you see in the market that led you to building it? Uh, and, is, and is any part of that tech still in use today? Yeah, I mean, that was... It was actually called Kaiju. We 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 were operating under a different name at the time, um, which was Synergis, uh, and we switched to Kaiju because when we started our kind of global expansion and things like branding and trademark uh, were elements that we had to consider. You know, our advisors came back and said that Synergis just wasn't brandable. Really, there were there were too many close uh company names and we really needed to find something different to call ourselves and based on what we were trying to accomplish this sort of um <laughs> monster system that we were building we appropriated the name from this proprietary uh tool set that we built which was kaiju and we just named the ecosystem all of our companies kaiju um and really we 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 built that i mean i'm sure anybody who's watching who's been trading for a while I'm sure there are there are tools, there are functions, features that you wish you had access to that whatever platform you're using doesn't do. And you've customized these things, whether it's your OMS, EMS, or your visualization software, charting, analytics, to the extent that you're able to. But you get to a point where, you know, the developers just didn't build the specific tool that you want. And so most... Uh, sort of investment managers at our size or larger, when that happens, will build your own internal system. So you can work with, you know, companies like, you know, Bloomberg, and they'll build custom panels for you up to a certain point. But really, if you're doing something that's very unique, in our case, there were, there was, a, there were, it was a system that we wanted to use to visualize complex options trades. And, you know, we collaborated with SIBO via LiveVol and what is now LiveVol Pro used to be LVX. Uh, we collaborated, we tried to collaborate with Silex that, that they weren't able to do much for us there. And no, again, no 
criticism of them. I mean, you're like one shop saying, hey, can you build me this, you know, weird thing that nobody else has asked for? So we just started building it internally. Actually, uh, when we were a shop of just five people at the very beginning, our CTO, David Schooley, and uh, some of our developers started building this thing. And it just grew and grew and grew until it really became this sort of all-consuming monster system that seemed appropriate to call Kaiju. And uh, and yeah, it's still in use today. We, we use it more for uh, scan distribution and... Uh, and order execution instructions from the AI system. So our our uh, our traders are watching the outputs from this system to uh, determine what adjustments they should make. Not not for dip, but for the the private side fund strategies that we run. Got it. That makes sense. Um, so Ryan, I understand that you were uh, working with AI back in 2018. Uh, in a recent interview, you described the the view of what you were doing as practicing the dark arts. You were like you were Professor Snape over here. Uh, what made you make the leap then? I mean, 2018, we're talking about five years ago. I'm sure there were a lot of people who, you know, would be skeptical of making that move to such a new technology that's not established yet. Yeah, I guess it for us, it really it addressed one of the fundamental challenges that accompanies quantitative trading and investing, right? Quantitative trading has been around for ages. There's nothing new about that. The challenge with quantitative systems is that they're static, right? There's no machine learning layer to them. So, you know, you're sort of trying to avoid curve overfitting. You're looking back through historical data and you're asking yourself, what could I have done in these environments using this strategy, that strategy, you know, these assets in order to get a favorable outcome. And, you know, you randomize the testing as, as well as you can, but you still have this inherent challenge. You can't forget what happened, right? So you know that the pandemic is coming at the end of Feb 2020. And so you're specifically looking for positions you could have taken that would have uh, safeguarded against that. But in reality, would you have applied that not knowing that this global pandemic was coming at the time? I mean, we were right at the top end of a historic melt up, you know, and we were running systems at the time, you know, thank God that uh, that helped us take a downside defensive position prior to the pandemic. But like, it's not like the AI identified the pandemic. It, it you know, we just identified imbalances that we couldn't explain and indicated we should take a protective position. So prior to using AI, you know, you would you know, build a quantitative system. It would work for a while, but when market participants change, conditions change, et cetera, these things tend to break and they require human intervention. You go back and you're like, well, this isn't working anymore. What am I going to do? And because of the machine learning layer that's common to all AI systems, we don't do that anymore. The machine teaches itself. So as things change, it's a quantitative system that's able to constantly update and at a scale, frequency, and level of refinement that we could like never do as a person. But you're talking about a collective of scientists here, right? So for us, it just, it made sense. It was an obvious thing to start building. It was a lot of heavy lifting. Um, you know, Dr. Aitor Muguruza, who who came on at the onset, <laughs> and Nicholas Sabrian, the our director of AI, had a tremendous amount of work to do building these systems from the ground up. We started pulling assets from Imperial College in London, and and you know it grew from there. But you turn around and you talk to investment advisors that are sort of very comfortable with fundamental analysis and investing in that way, same way they. You know, people have been investing for literally hundreds of years <laughs> and, you know, they just look at you like you're nuts. You're going to hand this decision making over to a machine. And especially when you start making statements like you don't care what the company does. You don't care when it's reporting. You don't care right. what it makes. You know, people, well, well, you know, why do you think the AI added Disney to the portfolio last week? because it saw a pattern that it thought was going to be profitable. It literally doesn't care about Disney or what it's, you know, potential future profitability might be. And this is just, 
it's so counter to how a lot of people invest that there's a lot of closed mindedness around it. And we're not saying it's it's better or it should simply replace that way of investing. We're saying that there's room for both to coexist. And people are starting to now see that that's true. Yeah, and I'm sure back then, you know, like you said, there were people that were probably very skeptical saying, I can't believe you're giving away this. So it, you, it must feel at least somewhat vindicating that, you know, everything that's gone on this year, we're now, everyone in on wall street whether they want to or not has to at least you know focus on ai a little bit now and what and what's been going on so uh like i said i'm sure that just feels good for you to be like hey like i, I was on to something five years ago and all those people were, were were telling me i was crazy um but but so ryan so this is you know kind of been a new interesting recent development um, and I think a lot of people have anticipated some sort of types of, of regulation surrounding AI, but uh, the U.S. Copyright Office issued a notice of inquiry uh, in the Federal Register seeking public comment on questions about copyright law and policy issues raised by AI systems. Uh, this comes after the news recently that the New York Times, amongst others, were considering legal action against open AI on copyright grounds. Uh, how do you view all of this? What responsibility, if any, does AI or the companies that create them have toward the human creators behind the material that AI is referencing? So real quick, I'll try to explain it. Like basically, if, if you go to any of these image generators on AI and you say, hey, paint me an image of a dog on a skateboard, the AI are, are, are using thousands of pictures and, and art that's already out there to come up with these things. And obviously that art had to come from somewhere. So all these different photographers, artists, et cetera, with, uh, that, uh, whose art is being used by AI are coming together and saying, hey, we never you know, signed off on this. We never signed off on this. Um, so wh wh what are your thoughts on kind of this issue that's being raised by the US Copyright Office? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a, a key area of focus right now, right? And it all boils down to model training. So when you build an AI system, and it doesn't matter what it does, but when you build a system, you have to train it on an enormous uh, number of data. And <clears throat> the question is, where are you getting that, right? And for financial services, we're lucky in that, you know, these questions never get directed towards us because there have always been mechanisms for us to buy data. We all buy data. Benzenga buys data. You know, you subscribe to real-time data feeds. You can buy from Oprah, you can buy from Arca, you can buy from NASDAQ, you can buy from Morningstar, Zacks. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, like you've, you've got these data aggregators. You can go out, we use ICE, and you, know, you buy these data from these institutions. You've paid for it. So now you could do whatever you want with these data. The challenge with things like uh, LLMs like ChatGPT, Midjourney, uh, Lenza.ai, um, Dali, you know, the image generators that you're talking about is that they're scraping publicly accessible information on the internet, but for profit and without the permission of the person that created it. So just because you're an artist and you put your art up on you know deviant art or it's a stock image in a big stock library or something like that does not mean that somebody can come along train a for-profit ai system on it and then make money essentially systems with proprietary content, right? Like you're teaching it how to write, how to talk. It's it's a mimic, but you're now mimicking thousands potentially of New York Times journalists who were never compensated for the training of this model. And that's that's something that, you know, I my personal opinion, if it's for profit, then you should have music program and Apple TV, Netflix has done it, et cetera, et cetera. Like content licensing isn't new. So you can do it. It's just a, obviously it's a lot cheaper if you build this monster system.
and uh, and yeah, that's 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 not great. Where you get into the gray area is uh, in something like the medical field, right? You're training these systems to root out uh, a chronic disease and discrete illness and things of that nature. Are you compensating the companies and institutions that paid money to do the studies that you're scraping to inform the machine? Right. You probably should, but there's an argument to be made for, well, this is this is to provide better medical care. So if you're doing it at like the federal level, the government le level, maybe there's a case that you know you should be able to access that information for free. If you're doing it at the private level, again, it's the same thing. You're making money off of the system you're going to sell. But somebody else ultimately paid the price for your AI to get so smart. That's that's where we're at right now. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think it's it's kind of a byproduct of any time you have a brand new technology or brand new industry developing, there will be these kind of gray areas where hey, look, we don't we don't have the guidelines or regulations in place because we've never had this before. We've never had a, a chat GPT or open AI, you know, doing these things. So it's kind of for the first time, uh, you know, on, on the on the run, I guess, you know, the regulators and, and people in charge are going to have to try to figure out what really the best route is. And like you said, in the case of, me of, of the medical stuff, there might be arguments that say, hey, actually, this is for the better of, of, of society to let uh, you know, so it'll it'll just be interesting to I think see how this plays out. Um, um, but so Ryan, let's let's continue on because we've only got about five minutes left. Uh, you're headlining a panel at Future Proof next week called "Breaking Barriers," featuring CEOs who have changed the game. In your case, using AI. Uh, for those of us who can't attend, can you give us a little sneak peek, a little preview of what you guys will be talking about? Yeah, I think this is. Um... It's a panel that's mostly focused on uh, breaking barriers uh, in traditional investment management, but largely uh, in ETFs. Um, and there's panelists, there's uh, uh, panelists represented representing systematized trading, uh, alts, and alternatives to active management, uh, etc. So for my part, what I'm just going to probably try to speak to, I think there's like 3,000 RIAs that are there. I'll be just trying to speak to why it's uh, why one should keep an open mind in terms of AI making endpoint investment management decisions. You know, there's there's we and you and I have talked about this a lot before. There's still a lot of skepticism coming off the back of the crypto implosion. You know, you have yet another new technology that's a little hazy for the layperson to understand. And you have a bunch of experts saying, don't worry, we got this. You should trust it. This is why. And you have a lot of investment managers and advisors that are like, yeah, I'm just going to wait and see. I'm not going through that thing again. So for me, it's about discussing uh, questions that they might want to ask. And this goes for any investor, some folks that are watching you know, you want to know what type of AI is being used and whether it's black box or rules based and then determine whether or not if it's rules based, the rules that are in place line up with your investment ideology. That That's really sort of key. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, you know, build a little confidence in, in, in my short time on that panel and, uh, and and start the long road back to back to trust. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and and it's, I think a good time for you to be doing those types of panels and and whatnot because you know I've said it before, but right now it does seem like kind of all attention, not all, I shouldn't say all attention, but like that's been the biggest thing this year so far on Wall Street is people just want to know more about AI and it's it's it, it's not it's it's basically every facet of it really too that I think people want yearn for more understanding of whether it's okay how is this. Dip ETF actually working? How is the AI actually picking these stocks? What is going to happen next with AI? You know, what what should be the right regulations when it comes to copyright? All these questions, all these things, um, I think are things that people, you know, like I said, want to have a better understanding of. It's hard because the technology is so new and and it's and it's you know for a, a lack of a better term, kind of complicated as I'm sure you know some of the AI machine learning stuff. And so for if if 
Ryan, if you're not someone like yourself who's been in it for five years and you're kind of seeing it for the first time, you're trying to understand how it relates to the financial world, what impacts it's going to have. It's it's kind of overwhelming to be honest. So that's why I'm, I've been very grateful to have you, you know, come on the show every day or every Tuesday for the past uh, few weeks. Because now I do feel I'm not going to turn around, Ryan, and, and say to anyone that I'm an AI expert. But if someone now has questions about AI, I, I feel like after our conversations, I'm in a better position to answer those questions, uh, or at least to maybe help them have some better understanding of it than I was you know, two months ago before we started talking. You probably feel more comfortable with it as a technology, as an investment tool, right? In the very beginning, you're probably like, wow, like, why should I trust this? And how is this just not going to run amok? And now you probably have a better sense of, well, it's they, they'd actually have to program it to you know, go nuts for it to go nuts. Right. And that's, that's, I think, what the biggest thing is. I mean, I think for, you know, a lot of people see AI and, and think that it's already kind of this sentient, you know, thing and it's got AGI, all this stuff. When in reality, it's like, okay, if you're a, if you're a human and, you know, you're, you touch a hot stove and you don't know, chances are you're going to register that and then not touch the hot stove again. And that's basically what the AI does. Is it uses things like that, then learns from it. So it's not really any different. You know, it's not doing anything crazy. It's just kind of recognizing patterns and going off of it. And then, like you said, doing what it is programmed to do, which is the biggest thing, because I think, like I said, a lot of people in their head think, okay, it's a sentient, you know, whatever, or maybe it will be eventually. Yeah. But really, it's, 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 it, it, it's not... It's similar in a lot of ways to basically all the other computer programs and stuff that it, it's it's doing what it, it has been programmed uh, to do. So it shouldn't be that scary, at least not yet, Ryan. I mean, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, um, I mean, we've got a, we've got a long way to sentience. So and long and there's lots of opportunities for us to screw it all up. But for right now, no, it's just uh, it's pretty well contained. Yeah. Um, let's, 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 let's knock on wood. Hope it stays there for a while, but who knows, maybe in five years, the conversation we're having about, uh, AI sentience is, is a lot different. Who knows? Um, all right, but let's get to the Kaiju kicker eye and then we'll wrap up for the day. Uh, a popular question from, uh, from new traders is that what size of portfolio could a retail trader responsibly expect to support themselves through trading their own account? I believe you, you mentioned a few weeks ago, you know, if if if, if you wanted to start trading, to start with a paper trading account for like six months, is is that right? Absolutely. Like I I've sort of always kind of I get asked this question a lot, obviously from you know like friends and family kind of thing. Hey, you know, you were a trader for years and a portfolio manager and whatever, and I want to start trading. How much money do I need? So which is kind of a loaded question, right? And I, I always say, like, look, your your broker probably offers a paper trading account. If not, uh, companies like Warden, you know, TC2000, you've got a charting program and, and it comes with a paper trading account built in. You can message them and say, hey, can you, you know, make it a million dollars, make it a hundred grand, make it 50 grand, and 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 they'll they'll change this for you. I think you can even add paper trading accounts, but it's been a while for me. So, um, yeah, I always say six months on a, on a, on a, a simulator. If you can't, first of all, if you can't do that, if it's like, I don't have six months to wait, I want to get into this. You just, you don't have the discipline to be a trader to start with. Like you're just not going to make money. So save yourself the hassle. You should be able to, uh, paper trade for six months. You'll probably go through at least two market conditions. So you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to, get a distorted view of your profitability because you just happen to start, you know, training during a favorable market condition for your strategy. And you're like, I'm awesome. And then you blow up. So it lets you see at least a couple market conditions. And if you're profitable on the paper trading account after six months, yeah, sure. Go for real money. If you're not, you should probably continue practicing. Like it's going to be worse when it's real money. So that's, you know, bucket one that, and then getting started, any amount, right? I mean, you could have like two grand, a thousand dollars, whatever. You can start trading really small amounts. You will not be supporting yourself at all at, at that size and you have all kinds of restrictions. You will not be able to open that many positions. Uh, and you won't have access to sort of like prosumer um, or semi pro brokerage accounts like interactive brokers. That's, I think they're, they used to be 15 grand or higher. Maybe it's 10 now. I don't know, but uh, you can look it up then you get like a a pro proper semi-pro brokerage accounts so that's retail and small funds are are 
packed into that. Um, but anything under, you know, 21 or 25,000, the pattern day trader rule is, is again, going to limit you to five round trip trades a week, right? So you can still trade if you're practicing position trading, then you know, that's fine. You know, you're going to adjust your portfolio weekly, probably on Sunday anyway, for execution Monday, doesn't matter how much you have, but if you want to, if you want to intraday trade, which you really shouldn't do. But if you want to especially swing or, or momentum trade, then you need to be outside of the pattern day trader rule, which is over like whatever it is, $25,000. And then finally, over 100 grand gets you into portfolio margin and out of reg T margin, which means that you'll get your money will go a lot farther in terms of um, the leverage that you can use, especially with options. So, you know, you got these different buckets and it depends what you want to do. If you're looking you know, if you want to, I don't know, supplant a $200,000 a year salary and use your own account, I hope you have a million dollars or more to stuff in that. Like, you're just not going to make that over, I'm going to make 100% per month every month. No, you won't. Um, and I, I wish you could. I wish I could say that you could, but you can't. Uh, if you're looking to supplement an income, you know, work one job instead of two, work part-time instead of full-time. Yeah, you don't need a ton of money to do that, but you probably need more than you think you do. I mean, I started with like a $15,000 home equity line of credit and uh, I was fortunate enough to grow that very quickly, but that's an anomalous result. I mean, really at that level, you can expect a couple hundred dollars a month in, in profit. If it's, you want to get into the thousands, you're going to need more money. But again, depends on the trader, depends on the goal, etc. I, I, I know that kind of answered and didn't answer the question at the same time, but that's something oh, we I can think, maybe I think dig does, into I think, later. I, I, I think for, I think, I, I think more than what you probably think you need is, is, it sounds like, cause here's the thing, Ryan, is I think a lot of people, and like you said, you know, you've had a lot of people reach out and ask you that question. How much money do I need if I want to start trading for myself? And I'm just going to venture and guess, maybe you're getting that question a lot more a couple years ago, you know, during COVID when the markets were basically just going up and it, and it seemed, you know, Hey, anyone can do this. Um, but I think people, you know, a lot of us are optimistic and we're wishful thinkers. So if you make a couple of good trades and you're doing some math in your head and you're like, well, you know, I made six and a half percent last week. If I just do that every week, then I'm at 30% a month and then I'll be at, you know, 360% on the year. And then, you know, exactly. so I think a lot of people have this very optimistic thinking. So they think, okay, I can start with 10 grand and, you know, we'll have a hundred thousand by the end of next year. And it's like, okay. Yeah, maybe you had a hot week or maybe you had a couple of like trades, but no one's getting, you know, six and a half percent a week or whatever it is, you know, whatever. Exactly. It is. So I, right. And you have and, like a good bet, you catch a gap, you know, your trade returns 18%. You're like, okay, so if I do that just 20% of the time, you're like, yeah. It's just well, I, I, yeah, I mean, look, Ryan, I'll be the first to admit, you know, I mean, I can be kind of dumb sometimes. I think we all can. I think that's just part of the human condition is we're as humans, like our brains aren't computers and we, you know, just are dumb sometimes. That's like one of my big core beliefs is that we as humans aren't, I just are not perfect, you know. And I remember like right when COVID hit, uh, uh, you know, my, my, so I was actually, my, my brain was actually being pretty smart and I bought a bunch of puts on the market, you know, cause I was like, okay, this COVID thing, like seems pretty serious from everything I'm seeing, you know, from like the medical doctors I follow on Twitter and everything, but yet the stocks hadn't gone down that much either way made like a bunch of money. Like there were a couple of days where off like $800 in my checking account or $800 in my Robinhood account, like, like made like three grand in one day, just buying puts on, on the spy and, and cues. And I was like, shit if i make a thousand dollars trading options every single day it's like no of course there of course you're not gonna be able to do that but i was right because like, i was like, you, I was like 20. you forget it's not just the drop right if you're buying put options it's the vix going to friggin 80 like right i i, I literally timed that it ever I, happen like i, I you timed it that to happen too well here look i i, I can just oh hold on like the vega component with that i, I was sort of debriefing with uh my cousin runs a fist fixed income desk at at, at uh, merrill and we were talking kind of you know two weeks after all the halts and the collapse it's like did you ever think you'd see a vix at 80 no you no <laughs> it's like if you'd told me last week i'd think you were nuts and yet there it was 
Yeah, so this was my this is my Robin Hood all time. First of all, up five hundred dollars. So let's just, let's just put that out there, not in the red. Uh, but February twenty twenty, you can see right here, boom. Here's where the the market crashed. March sixteenth, I think was like the lowest point in the market. I was up eleven grand. Guess what? Ha guess what happened within two months of that, Ryan? Bam, back <laughs> down to up six forty. So. Uh, you know, that was a good learning experience for me. It was kind of my first time trading options. I was like 22 and I was like, you know, I mean, I th honestly, I, I, could, I, 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 hindsight's 2020. If I just would have sold all my options, just like put it in the spy, I'd be up double that right now. And I would have had, you know, it would have been less work, but I, but you, you know, didn't got, know, right. You got didn't know. I didn't and, know. Now I do. You know, when, when you, when you first trading options and you've got your directional component that's working for you or it's like right before expiration. The move happens, you get a gamma kick there. You're not really sure the Vega component. So you're not paying attention to VIX at all, you know? And you have one of these, you know, I I, I knew uh, a friend who started trading options, did a little course. And then during um, uh, the first threat of the trade war uh, in... Uh, you know, 2016 and 2017, you know, market lurches, VIX pops, guy had some put options. And just like you was like, whoa, that was easy money, 20% yeah. month. But then the next time that happened, nothing really moved. He kept waiting for it to happen. Theta basically ate his premium away. And he got out under where he bought in at, even though the market had trended down. It was like, I don't understand what just happened. It was like... <laughs> Okay, here's a here's a book on options trading you might consider reading. So, I mean, you have these experiences, right? And it's easy enough to extrapolate out and go, well, I'll just repeat that every time without realizing right. that you had sort of a perfect storm there that made that what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you ever golf, Ryan, but it's like if I hit if I hit a drive just right down the middle of the fairway, I can I can be like, "Oh, I'll just do that every time." Yeah, I'll, I'll do just that every do time. That. I'll just do that. Whatever I did there, that's I'll just do that. That's what keeps you coming that. back, right? Like that's yeah. the part of golf that keeps you coming back. You know, you but I don't, few yeah. holes and it's a disaster. And you're like, I hate this stupid game. And then you do something magical and you're like, well, now hold on. It's not so bad. <laughs> Maybe so I bad, can just yeah. do that again. You totally can't, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, Ryan, gone a few minutes over uh, over today, but, but, but very happy to do so because we've been having a great conversation as always. Thanks again for hopping on uh, with us today on Benzinga Live. I'll drop that uh, Kaiju link in the chat if you guys want to go check out more. Again, the, the ETF is DIP, uh, ticker D-I-P. Uh, so go check that, out, check that out if you guys want to. Great. I'll see some of you guys, uh, I think, at Future Proof next week. Yeah, well, I'll have to. We'll have to. Uh, I don't know if that uh, panel is going to be recorded or whatnot, Ryan. If I can watch it, otherwise, you'll have to just uh, give me a give me a recap, give me the lowdown next week after. I think Scott and Mike might be there. Look forward to catching up with them in the sunshine. Beautiful. All right, Ryan. Well, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you again for hopping on Benzinga Live with us. Thanks, Aaron. Take care. All right, guys, that was Ryan Pinnell from uh, Kaiju. I'm going to, again, drop that uh, link in the chat, Dip ETF. Uh, if you guys want to go check that out, really cool things they're doing over at Kaiju, using AI uh, to manage this ETF, buy some buy some dips. I was actually looking at Dip ETF's holdings uh, earlier today, or at least the holdings as of August 31st. Uh, Lululemon, Marvel Technologies, some of the stocks that Dip has been buying, so those are uh, interesting to me. All right. Uh, give me literally 10 seconds, squad. My computer's on 3%. I got to plug it in. And... All right. Let's see if this works. Bam. It worked. All right, guys, uh, only got a few minutes left of this show today. Let me just go uh, go ahead and pull up my Benzinga Pro, uh, and we'll run through some stocks. I mentioned Netflix earlier. So I gave a thesis on Netflix on this show a while ago um, that basically, okay, and, and, and granted, this was back when uh, Netflix was a little bit lower. Of a, uh, you know, the stock price was a little bit lower. It was in the 300s, not the 400s. But my thesis on Netflix was this. It's the fact it's that a good market slash economy 
okay, Netflix's stock should benefit from that, uh, in part because Netflix's stock, remember, I mean, when, when growth went out of favor, Netflix's stock went down like 80%. Netflix's stock was one of the, 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 the stocks that drew down the most, at least when you're talking out of these like mega market cap, you know, I mean, Netflix's stock like drew down more than an Apple did, more than a Microsoft did. Uh, and I'm talking about, of course, in, in 2022 when the markets uh, kind of started to turn over. Netflix's stock has been on a big, big, you know, uptrend since. It's basically at, uh, you know, a little bit more than half of where it was at at its highs. But I mean, it got down to about 150. It's back up to 450 right now. So about three, three times um, from those lows in mid 2022. But my thesis goes like this, is that I think you can make a bullish argument for Netflix, uh, whether the economy stays strong or not. And hear me out here. So as... Uh, you know, as more and more economists anticipate some sort of economic slowdown, uh, and and that's you know, of course, because of the Fed continuing to raise interest rates, inflation, uh, you know, persisting at least somewhat, people's credit card, you know, debts on average rising. So there's this there's this idea that at some point, maybe not right now, maybe in a couple months, maybe in six months. There will be a general, you know, not not a like grinding halt to the economy or anything like that, but there will be a general slowdown of spending just slightly, which any slowdown, I mean, the, our economy is basically is, is reliant on growth, right? If GDP growth was just 0%, 0.0% all the time, people wouldn't be that interested in investing in the U.S. economy. It's not growing. So the... Just being stable isn't really enough for the economy. You have to be growing. That's part of our system is you have to be uh, growing. So any type of slowdown is seen as I don't want to say catastrophic, but I mean, like, like I said, any, even if it's a even if it's a, a, a mild slowdown in spending, people will construe that as a recession. My thought is that at it, when and if families do start cutting back on spending, Netflix is actually going to be something that people cut like last. And hear me out. If you're talking about eating out, you're talking about vacations, you're talking about, uh, you know, getting food delivered. You're talking about entertainment costs like concerts and sporting games. Every single one of those things that I just mentioned, including just getting one meal from Uber Eats or from DoorDash, etc., costs more than a monthly Netflix subscription. If a family is trying to save money, Netflix is probably the best purchase you can make because if you've got eight kids, sorry, I don't know why I said eight. That's a lot. I don't think people have eight kids anymore. If you've got four kids and you got to all spend money on them doing shit, buy a Netflix so that they can watch, you know, countless episodes of SpongeBob is like the best eight ninety nine you can spend per month. Right. If you're, if you're right, I'm not saying Turning on Netflix for your kids is as as entertaining for them as going to Disney World or going to, you know, the bowling alley, whatever it is. Of course not. But it is going to be cheaper. It is going to be cheaper. So for families that are trying to save money in an economic slowdown, I, again, think Netflix is one that, if anything, benefits from this because there will probably be people that are saying, OK, well, let's get a Netflix subscription and that way we'll try to save money in these other areas. Now. Here's the point. Here's the point of my thesis where I'll say that I have no data, no anything to back this up. This is just a hunch that I have. And then again, the flip side to that, so that's kind of in, in a bearish economy. That's how I view what would happen with Netflix. In a bullish economy, guess what? The stock keeps going up because we're because it's a bullish economy and Netflix's stock is still, I mean, it's still beaten being down from where it was. Well, it's a 28 PE. I mean, it's it's not like this is like super overpriced. Uh, you know, price to sales is 6.1. I mean, right now, I think I think sub subscriptions are growing because Netflix, you know, started cracking down on the password sharing and all this stuff. So, look. I'm not saying I'm running out and backing the truck up on Netflix right here. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if you're looking, I, I just wouldn't look at 450 on Netflix and think, okay, this is so overpriced. I don't want, you know, I, I can't touch it. So just something to keep an eye on. Uh, Netflix. Another stock been watching EOSE Energy. Uh, of course, this stock got its DOE loan last week. The stock popped, now kind of selling off. 
this is to me a, a kind of a red flag, at least in the short term, for the stock. Just the fact that the the company got the major catalyst that everyone was looking for. Okay, I let me give some more context for people that aren't familiar. Uh, EOS E's uh, Energy. It's a like you know very small cap, uh, and you know company working on some clean tech, some some green tech, energy solutions. Um, you know, like battery storage states to storage solutions. Energy storage solutions is how I would describe it. So that's basically one of the biggest problems with clean energy right now is we can produce all this wind and solar, et cetera, um, but we don't have a good way to store it. We can store uh, fossil fuels and, and that type of, of energy really well, right? You, can, you have coal, you have oil, it's, it's stored, it's in a barrel, it's good to go. With wind or solar energy, we don't really have a good way of storing it. Uh, so once someone figures that out, they're going to make a lot of money. EOS has some promise in that. Uh, await, they were awaiting a DOD loan to get some of this moolah, some of that bread from uh, Biden's administration that's been investing a lot of money in different clean energy initiatives. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of anticipation about this loan. A lot of retail investors were getting in this stock. The company got its loan <clears throat> last week. The stock popped up to about 480 and now it's back down. To 370. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on with my voice right now. So, what that tells me that these a lot of people were hype on the stock itself, like as an investment, because of this DOD loan, and because the stocks dropped so much from I mean 480 down to 370. There's a lot of explanations from there, just that it, it had a lot of hype. Uh, could have been kind of one of those buy the rumor, sell the news events, um, but. And I like, I mean, I, this movement is significant to me because basically you have retail investors who are buying the stock because the DOD loan, the company gets the DOD loan. Okay. Now the stock's back down. If, um, if, if this DOD loan was immediately so impactful for the company and the company's revenue and bottom line, like, and I'm talking like, okay, they get this DOD loan. And then next quarter, their profits are going to be up 100%. I think you'd have like some more big money institutions, players coming in here and saying like, this is interesting. Now, part of it is, you know, you, you can't get a lot of in terms of like wealth managers and people that have, you know, billions of dollars of assets under management of different wealthy people. And they're out buying investments and in stocks for these people. A lot of times those people will just kind of shy away from stocks, these small anyway, because even if even if they're right and it goes up 100 percent, there still might be people that like, hey, what the hell were you buying that, you know, 500 million dollar company in my portfolio for? So I think that's part of it, that there's, you know, just market cap requirements for certain stocks uh, and that that certain institutional players can't get in because of that. But like I said, my bottom line is, look, now they got this loan. It's out there. Why hasn't why 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 hasn't, you know, that bullish activity continued, not even continued? Why hasn't there just been enough buying pressure to at least keep that stock like elevated under or from where it went? So we'll see. Uh, definitely an interesting one. We'll keep an eye on Netflix, EOSC, two of the top ones that I'm watching. Uh, at the moment, all AI trading tools are snake out. Okay. Well, that's why I like. I mean, I wouldn't go out right now, Wham Trader, and buy like an AI trading bot or whatever. Uh, but if you were interested in it, you know, you can just buy a few shares, this deep, dip ETF, then dip it, ETF is kind of doing it for you. You don't need to like buy any of these tools or anything, which is what I like about it. It's a good way to kind of get some exposure. You can do it with just like a hundred bucks, see what it's doing with that hundred bucks. I don't know. It's worth checking out. Um, but all right, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show today. I uh, hope everyone had a great long weekend. We'll be back again all week with some great content here. Smash the like, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not already. Uh, and peace.